Okay, let's talk about appendicitis misdiagnosis. It happens. It does. And it's a significant surgical emergency, so getting it right matters. Providers definitely face some uh, real diagnostic challenges with it. Well, that leads to delays in treatment. Which increases the risk of perforation, doesn't it? Exactly. And it can lead to unnecessary operations or just generally worse outcomes for the patient. So we're going to look at five key reasons why this happens. Right. Let's get into it. First one. Atypical presentations. The symptoms aren't always textbook. Not at all, especially in certain populations. Think yeah. about children, maybe just irritability, some, you know, vague discomfort. And older adults. They might have much more subtle signs of inflammation. It can be harder to spot. Pregnant patients, too. That presents its own unique picture. Absolutely. And then there's the overlap issue. What do you mean by overlap? Well, particularly in women, you have gynecologic conditions that can mimic appendicitis. Okay, like what? Ovarian cysts, pelvic inflammatory disease, things like that. But also gastroenteritis or even urinary infections can muddy the waters. So the takeaway is to keep a really broad differential for abdominal pain in these groups. Precisely. You have to cast a wide net initially. All right. Reason number two, over-reliance on tests. Mm -hmm. This is a big one. Imaging, like ultrasound or CT, it's helpful, but it's not foolproof. It can miss early appendicitis or localized cases. Yes. And image quality can be an issue, too. Depends on the patient's body habitus, sometimes the skill of the operator. What about lab work? Labs have limitations as well. Early on, the white blood cell count might be completely normal. Inflammatory markers, too. They might not be elevated initially, which can be falsely reassuring. Uh -huh. And sometimes you see mild urinary abnormalities, and that might steer you towards thinking it's a urinary tract infection when it's not. So even if tests come back normal. If your clinical suspicion is high, you can't just rule out appendicitis based on normal tests alone. What should you do then? Consider a period of observation or get a surgical consult involved early. Okay. Moving on to number three. Incomplete Physical exams. Yeah, the physical exam is absolutely fundamental here. And it needs to be thorough. Thorough is key. Things like rectal exams, for example, they're often omitted, but can provide valuable information. What specific signs are we really looking for? Well, you're assessing for that classic right lower quadrant tenderness. Right. Rebound tenderness, so pain when you release pressure quickly. Guarding where the abdominal muscles tense up. And that pain migration pattern. Yes, the pain starting around the umbilicus, the belly button, and then shifting to the lower right side. That's quite suggestive. I'm missing these signs. It can easily lead to discharging a patient too early or just heading down the wrong diagnostic path altogether. Makes sense. Number four is about cognitive biases. Ah, yes. The traps our own thinking can set for us. Anchoring bias is a major one. Explain that a bit. It's where you sort of latch on to an initial impression or diagnosis, maybe based on the first few symptoms. And then you don't reconsider. Exactly. You fail to step back and rethink, even if new information comes in. Like um, seeing diffuse pain and diarrhea and immediately labeling it gastroenteritis without fully considering appendicitis. And confirmation bias. That's where you subconsciously look for evidence that supports your initial thought. And you might downplay or ignore signs that contradict it. Both sound pretty dangerous in this context. They absolutely are. They lead to delays, misdiagnoses, and a higher risk of complications. How do you combat that? Being aware is the first step. Using systematic approaches, checklists, forcing yourself to consider alternatives that can help mitigate these biases. Which brings us nicely to number five, failure to consider the differential diagnosis adequately. Right. Appendicitis is a great mimic. It can look like so many other conditions. We mentioned some for women earlier. Yes. Pelvic inflammatory disease, ruptured ovarian cysts, ectopic pregnancy. Those are crucial to consider in women of childbearing age. What about other groups? In children, mysteric adenitis inflammation of the lymph nodes in the abdomen can look very similar. Air in adults. Things like Crohn's disease flare-ups or diverticulitis, especially right-sided diverticulitis. So misdiagnosis happens if you don't actively think about and try to rule out these alternatives. Pretty much. You need a targeted history, a really thorough exam focusing on potential mimics too. Like pelvic exams in women? or testicular exams in men, if indicated. Exactly. And using the right tests to investigate those other possibilities. Getting other specialists involved seems important, too. Definitely. In unclear cases involving surgeons, radiologists, perhaps gynecologists early, can significantly improve diagnostic accuracy. Teamwork helps. So let's recap how to try and avoid misdiagnosis. What are the key actions? 
Well, first, maintain a high index of suspicion. Always keep appendicitis on your list for abdominal pain, especially right lower quadrant pain. Perform those thorough systematic assessments we talked about. Don't cut corners on the exam. Interpret diagnostic tests cautiously. Understand their limitations. A normal test doesn't automatically mean no appendicitis. Involve multidisciplinary teams early when things aren't clear cut. Right. And if there's doubt, close observation is often much safer than sending someone home prematurely. Just raising awareness of these common pitfalls seems like a big step. It really is. Understanding why a misdiagnosis happens helps everyone be more vigilant. So the core issues are these varied presentations, the limits of our tests, sometimes incomplete exams, our own cognitive biases getting in the way, and not fully working through that differential diagnosis list. That sums it up well. Prompt and accurate diagnosis relies on vigilance and taking that comprehensive approach every time. So maybe the final thought for everyone listening is, reflecting on these five points, how might that influence your next assessment when a patient presents with abdominal pain? Good question to ponder. Being mindful of these potential traps is key. 